last week I spoke a little bit, began to speak on the tabernacle, and the real thing that I want to drive home is that you cannot, one cannot read the Old Testament and just say, I read it and I don't put the other half, the New Testament. Basically, one without the other leaves you with a lack of understanding. And I point this out and repeat it again, so forgive the repetition. But the last book of the Old Testament is Malachi. And that book ends with a curse. So if anybody's reading that and they're just reading it as an individual reading and you say, well, that's not a very good thing to note, equally take note that in Malachi, it mentions very clearly, and unless you're going to just be completely wear blinders and just ignore, there are clear references to the coming of Christ, the forerunner, John the Baptist, and the coming of Christ. In fact, book after book, there are enough pointers that this is not an ambiguous doctrine. It's clear that Jesus, although he took up a tent of human flesh, which starts the New Testament, the Old Testament has a plethora of Christophanies and Theophanies. That is the appearance of God or and or Christ, but not in human form. And I used the example last week of what appeared to Abraham on the plains of Mamre. You can say these were angelic beings, you can say Theophany, but if you read carefully, you're going to be hard-pressed to say it's just discounted. And of course, what I'm finding is that there are a lot of people who would just kind of like to say, well, that's the Old Testament. But my problem with that is there's too much, once you start reading Genesis and onward, there is too much information to just say, well, that's just an anomaly. It's not. So as I said, you can't read one without the other. From the Christian perspective, which obviously we are here, it's important to look at the whole concept. It's like saying, I only want to eat the inside of the orange, but I don't want the peel. It all comes together. And without one without the other, it doesn't make sense. Let's just say I just took up, started reading the New Testament without the old. It wouldn't make sense to me that God came in a tent of human flesh, as John describes it, because the very words, when you look back, are essentially saying that Christ tabernacled in a tent of human flesh. And everything that we're reading about in the New Testament is almost like if you know the Old Testament, you can see Christ everywhere, which is why I said I wanted to take us through the tabernacle and some specifics. I think I covered a lot of things last week, but probably the most important thing, of course, all the furniture, the colors, the materials, it all has meaning. The numbers have meaning. It all, there's nothing with God when he said to Moses, see to it that you build it exactly according to the pattern that I've revealed to you on the mountain. The book of Hebrews repeats that. It's really important to recognize that why would God say, do not deviate one iota? Well, that's because we know that when you get into the New Testament, even actually, I'm sorry, I take that back. When you are looking at Old Testament scripture, you find abundant references pointing to Christ and in the old confirming what was there. So, I like to use the word shadow and substance. So, of course, everybody knows what a shadow is, but the shadow is only a representation of the substance that, of course, in this case, the shadow is the tabernacle, the substance points to Christ. So, I also referred to several verses of Scripture, which most of you are familiar with, where it becomes very clear multiple times over especially the example I gave last week of the two disciples walking on the road, Emos, after the resurrection. And this figure appears next to them as they're walking, and they are long-faced and discouraged. And I felt like saying last week, but I'll say it now, I think they should have said, what, are you new here? <laughs> the old-timers will know what that means. But it's Christ that appears to them. And he says, all that was written in Moses and the prophets speaks of me. And he repeats this several times over and over again. So it's important to not ignore that if you understand he's referring to himself. Even in the place where he says, before Abraham was, I was. That's mind-boggling to some people who do not believe that there was a pre-incarnate Christ or pre-flesh, if you will. So all of these things make it very, very important 
The other thing I talked about last week, which I want to touch on again for a brief review, is blood. The blood runs through the Bible. It doesn't stop in the Old Testament. It goes straight through into the New. And this is the thing that I've grappled with myself, but if the Old Testament offerings, which pretty much are explained in great detail in the first five chapters of Leviticus, if they stopped, which they did, they stopped. In fact, if you go back far enough, you'll find out that it wasn't in 70 AD, but I use the 70 AD date as all sacrifices stopped because we know that is the fall of Jerusalem. And basically, there, there's nobody, there are no religious folks, there are no priests left. If they were, they went into hiding, but there was nobody left. They all fled under persecution. So the question is, for the Old Testament, if the way of salvation, especially in the first five chapters of Leviticus, which describe three offerings that are described of the nature and then two offerings that are described in substance, the sin and trespass offering, if those stopped, which they did, how are people in the modern age, but let's just go back to 70 AD, how were they being cleansed and forgiven of their sins and of their uncleanness if no sacrifices, no blood was being shed and there have been no sacrifices thereafter? Now, if you read the rabbinical literature, the rabbis will say, well, they went to the place where they made the sacrifices in the temple the specific place, but there were no sacrifices being made. God clearly says, without the shedding of blood, there remaineth no more remission for sin. So the big question is, if somebody is leaning into the Old Testament, how are sins being forgiven? So there are all these interesting questions, and I'm not going to get into that because that's a great debate. But my goal today is to look through the tabernacle and look at everything that points to in terms of shadow to the substance of Christ. And if we are going to really probe that, I'm going to make one more very strange mention, which I will make full circle at when I come to the close of this message. I think it was in 1980 or 1981, Steven Spielberg, for the young folks will go, what? Produced a movie called Raiders of the Lost Ark. And it kind of is the story of an adventurer archaeologist. I'm saying this for the young people. Everybody else knows what I'm talking about. An adventurer who is, finds himself outrunning the Nazi treasure hunters who are looking for, because they did, the Nazis were on the quest for occult items to collect these treasures. But the movie has some interesting depictions in it where the close of the movie specifically, the lid comes off and the whole encampment of people are wiped out and uh, you've got the main person in, in the, the main character, Indiana Jones, telling the woman that's with him, don't look, shield your eyes. And they do so everybody else is wiped out and the movie closes with the ark being put into a crate and put into some massive storehouse and that's that, okay? Well, wonderful ideology if you want to fantasize about stuff, but the Nazis certainly didn't take the Ark. And the fanciful idea, and of course, that the whole movie is settled in uh, or, or situated in Tannis, which it, I'll, I'll get to this at the close to show you where Steven Spielberg came up with this idea that the Ark would be located in Tannis, because everybody who in the real world was a treasure hunter went to several different locations thinking that's where it's at, based on some Old Testament references. So there are a lot of reasons to study the Ark. I began last week by telling you a little bit about the colors of the curtains, but let me start with the outside of the tabernacle. And I don't really maybe want to focus so much on measurements today, but I may or may not get there. But the white pure linen that walled off, if you think about it, the, the tribes of Israel, the 12 tribes of Israel are specifically and strategically placed around the tabernacle. But before you can even get into the tabernacle, you've got the priests, all the families of the priesthood that are surrounding, if you will, on all sides internally before you can even get in. And those white linen curtains represent purity, the holiness of God. Anybody approaching 
the tabernacle. You'd see it from far away, the white purity representing God's holiness. And if I were going to go down the numbers, I'd say to you the numbers of, of the measurements of the amount of curtains or boards on the outside, even those point to Christ. Each of those linen curtains had what is called a silver crown on the top. Silver is always the color of redemption. To the bottom, into the ground, brass. Always equated brass or copper, always equated with judgment. So if you think about it, even from top to bottom, a representation of Christ's death and resurrection, going into the ground in judgment, to the top, redemption, the white in the middle, God's holiness. So all of these things have their place. If I was going to go to kind of a pattern, the gate of the outer court, an introduction to God or revelation to God, which I think is pretty important because the New Testament tells us, at least from Christ's perspective and his words, no man can come. No person can come. They must be drawn. So people that say, I'm searching or I'm seeking, that may be true, but God is the one doing the drawing. And you may not know that, but that's what's called prevenient grace. Secondly, once you get in, you've got the brazen altar, which I tried to explain as a form, if you will, reconciliation. What is placed there, the sacrifice, and the specifics of the sacrifice, which could only be perfection offered there. Once more, Christ's sacrifice. If you read in the book of Hebrews, in fact, this may be helpful to some of those who, and yeah, they're saying, ah, I don't know what you're talking about, so let me help you out with that. Uh, book of Hebrews, kind of around the ninth chapter, we've got some ideas that help us kind of congeal this all together. Let me read this to you. And actually, I'm going to start before, I'm going to start right at the beginning. Then verily, the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. For there was a tabernacle made, the first wherein was the candlestick, the table, the table of showbread, which is called the sanctuary. And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, or the holy of holies, or holy place, rather, which had the golden censer, that's actually the holy of holies, the Ark of the Covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna, I just referenced that, Aaron's rod that budded, and the tables of the covenant unbroken. Uh, over it the cherubims of glory, shadowing the mercy seat, and that is the covering what in the Hebrew is called kapureth, which is where you get Yom Kippur, the day of covering, the day of atonement. So the mercy seat of which we cannot now speak particularly, but when these things were thus ordained, the priest went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. But into the second went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood, there it is, which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people. The Holy Ghost or Holy Spirit, this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while as the first tabernacle was yet standing, meaning to say that Christ had not come in the flesh yet, but all pointing to him, which was a figure of the time then present in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience which stood only in meats and drinks and diverse washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation. But Christ, being come a high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkled the unclean, sanctifieth the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? And for this cause he is mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. You don't write 
uh, last will and testament simply to do it for fun, it is in the event that one, the one who dies is able to say and get the last word. That's your last word and testament. But it is not in effect until you kick the bucket, right? Okay, that was spiritual. So just, just waking some of you up going, ah, oh, I'm falling asleep. Just checking to see that you're not sleeping on me, okay? So, for a testament is of force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. Whereupon neither the first testament was dedicated without blood. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and of goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the testament which God hath enjoined unto you. Moreover, he sprinkled with the blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of ministry, and almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. So the rest of that chapter, which is all but maybe a few verses, uh, five, six verses, tells and points more so to Christ. But that gives you an idea. And it's very, very important because the book of Hebrews, unlike other books of the Bible, you've got a lot of clear understanding of how to interpret the New Testament. So that gives you the understanding of all of these things pointing to him. As I talked about last week, the brazen altar, as you enter in, the brazen altar, which I could just say, generically speaking, representing reconciliation, the labor, separation, fellowship, cleansing, and for the New Testament, cleansing by the word, the candlestick, the way of illumination in the old, pointing to Jesus who says he's the light of the world, the table of showbread, this is a complicated one, and I'll just say in passing, everything about the table is very unique, the table of showbread or the bread of presence. But what's most unique, the old-timers know this, what's most unique is that what was placed on the table, which was the bread, is actually an offering from the people. What they gathered, they gathered, they ground up the manna, they ground it up, and then they offered it back to God. So that bread don't make everything symbolically and clearly to Christ, but it is indeed, the bread was indeed an offering from the people to God. So when people say, well, why should I give? A, well, it's cover to cover, that's where you'll find these things. And God was very specific. He didn't say, I'll make a special lot of manna for you to collect. Of what they collected, they were to take that portion, grind it up, and present it as an offering. And again, no mistake, you've got the number 12 for the loaves representing the 12 tribes. And then you look at the New Testament, you've got 12 disciples until, of course, Judas comes along and does his deed. But all of these numbers, all of these materials, all of these colors, the table of showbread also is a form of fellowship because that, when people think giving, they tend to think money. But actually, think about relationship, and that's kind of where you'll find yourself. The willingness to participate in God's program is a form of fellowship, of course. So the table has a multiplicity of meanings, not a singular one. The altar of incense, which is the intercession, the prayers, you could put that in two dimensions. One, Christ, who the Bible says ever liveth to make intercession for us. Equally, our prayers offered Depending on the way you look at it, I'm looking at it through the eyes pointing to Christ, so it is his intercession for us, and ultimately the Ark of the Covenant, as I expressed. I don't think it's accidental. The box itself, as I said, being that wood, which interestingly enough, if you read the Septuagint, which is the Old Testament put into Greek some two, three hundred years before Christ, when they call the wood a specific name, the translation of the wood is incorruptible, uncorruptible wood. In the Hebrew, you'll read it as shittim, and in the English at times, acacia. But it's supposed to be such a durable, non-destructible wood. So you've got that concept overlaid with the gold, which represents eternity or the Godhead. So uh, man and God represented there. The cherubims with their wings pointed in, and that's where the blood was sprinkled, on the top of that covering, the capora. So it's kind of interesting, if you think about it, if that box is pointing to Christ with the, the internal stuff, which we know he fulfills, 
the sprinkling of the blood between the cherubims equally, as I said, pictures or prefigures the type of Christ in that we know in the Gospels the witness of two angels inside the tomb. He is not here. He is risen. And that's after his blood was shed on the cross. So there's just, as I said, too many things to discount for this whole particular scenario. Now, we also have names that are important. So within the scriptures, you're going to find a bunch of different names, the tent of meeting. There are so many of them. Witness, the, obviously, the tabernacle, clearly the tabernacle in the wilderness. There's a bunch of different names, but it all comes back to the same thing. And you find yourself kind of looking at why did God need to build all of this? What was the point? And this is what I said last week. You notice that he tells Moses to build this, but then he does something strange. He doesn't start with build the fence or build this. He says, build the Ark of the Covenant first. Why? Because God said, I want to come and dwell among the people. And this is a really interesting concept. Again, you go back into the New Testament and you read about Christ taking up the tent of human flesh to come and dwell, but not in a cloud of smoke or of fire, which all represent God or God's power, not as a dove, comes in likeness we could identify with. And as I said, I'm almost done with my review. It's almost uh, half of my time here. But as I said last week, the most important thing is the book of Zechariah in the Old Testament. It says very clearly that when Christ returns, they will look upon him whom they pierced, specifically referring to the people who rejected him. Remember, in the opening of John's gospel, it says he came to his own and his own received him not. They will look upon him whom they pierced and mourn. And this is a very big, big subject because the unwillingness to acknowledge that there are not two messiahs, there's only one. There's only ever been one in God's design. And to the highly rabbinic people, he will come as a leper, fully diseased. Well, isn't that what happened at the cross? He took all the sins of the world upon himself. And this is why Zechariah in the Old Testament says, they'll look upon him whom they pierced. Speaking of those that crucified him, and they'll mourn, recognizing, oops, my bad. Okay? So you've got a little perspective there that gives you the background. So I think I've, I've given you enough review. I, I came with enough notes here that probably would drive most people crazy. So... <laughs> And it's a lot, trust me. So let me kind of touch on some of the things that I kind of want to talk about regarding the ark specifically. And we'll come to other parts of the furniture, but the ark is quite riveting to me. So the ark, as I said, sometimes referred to as the ark of testimony, ark of the covenant, ark of the Lord God, ark of God, and so on, holy ark. The first reference of the ark is God, as I just said, expressing his desire to dwell among the people. And we begin to see, as God's presence descends there, that the people aren't really listening to God, as very clearly, when you read the book of Exodus, smack dab right in the middle of the book of Exodus, chapter 32, while Moses is up, is up on the mount getting the law, they are busy building a golden calf with the booty they took out of Egypt. Everybody's taking off their earrings and their nose rings and everything else they have to melt it down to make a golden calf to worship. While Moses is up on the mount taking care of business with God, they're down there worshiping, basically idol worshiping, because they couldn't wait. And as I said, that's very emblematic of how we are. We're impatient, but we desire to worship something we can tangibly touch, or in many cases, we make a God of our own making and put a halo around it and call it something spiritual. There was nothing spiritual about the golden calf. In fact, it is essentially what caused Moses in his rage to break the first tables of stone. So think about this. God spends two chapters in the beginning of the Bible telling the creation, telling where man will live, and ten chapters discussing where he will live for a time only. That's kind of strange if you think about it, but very interesting. When God gave a second set, that second set was not really intended, if you think about it, to be handled by the people, or else why would it be put in the ark? And the interesting thing, again, about the ark, there are so many things kind of flood my mind that I'm trying to, like, stay focused. But those poles that 
were put into the ark to be carried. You couldn't just pick up the ark. There were loops, and those poles that were put in were designed to be carried on the shoulders of the designated priests. Think about this. Anybody who is charged with preaching the word of God is still doing the same thing. They're carrying it on their shoulders as a work of love and commission labor by God. But we are not touching God. Just like the ark, you didn't touch the insides or lift the lid. You're just responsible for carrying it. I love all of these different pictures that paint and repeat the same thing. The other thing is they had to keep it even, right? If they were carrying it, something that would be, think about this, they had a, a prescribed way for people, a prescribed way to lift it and carry it, right? And it was meant to be carried as evenly as possible. And I'd say that goes equally for those who preach the gospel to be even and balanced in the whole counsel of God and not cherry picking. I like this, but I don't like that, so I won't talk about that. The balance that's required to be able to carry the word or present it is very well depicted there. The staves themselves that went into the loop, same thing. Acacia wood representing humanity, overlaid with gold representing the deity of Christ. The staves remained with the ark until it was brought into Solomon's temple. You could read about that in 1 Kings 8.8. 8. While the ark moved through the desert wanderings and beyond the tabernacle, much like Christ's earthly ministry, if you think about it, the wanderings, no permanency. And I love that because, yes, did it go into the temple? Did it, was it transported into Solomon's temple? Yes, it was. But then disappeared. And by the way, that mystery of its disappearance still haunts people today who believe that they have somehow found the ark or they know where it is, which I'm, if you watch TV and you watch any of these programs, you've probably seen a ton of them where they're about to tell you where it is. Eh, not so much, right? It's kind of like that. So, but I, I have a, a small short list to uh, give you some insight by the close of the message. So, the next thing that people might ask is, well, what was the point of the offering? And I refer to the blood, refer to the importance of understanding, much like the Passover, where they had to apply the blood, and God's, we'll call it death angel, passed over the house when he saw the blood. This is from cover to cover. Old and new represent the same thing, except when you get to the new, the blood is no longer needed to be applied to the door and lentil of a house, supply to the heart, spiritually speaking, when one looks to Christ. So if you can understand that, Christ was not only the place of offering in himself, but he was also the offering himself. He represents the priesthood, the perfect priesthood. And I think if you keep going and you keep pulling down all the work of Christ, reference after reference, you're going to see they all point in that direction. I think probably I've covered most of this in a review. So let me talk to you a little bit about some speculation. Some people think the Ark of the Covenant was taken to Egypt, eventually to Tanis. There is a reference in 1 Kings 14.25 that talks about Shishak, the pharaoh, or Shishank. I believe he was the ruler of the 22nd dynasty, real pharaoh, inscribed in history. That's the other thing that blows my mind is there's enough evidence in this book of people confirmed in stone and in, in engravings and in monuments for people to say it can't possibly be real, including, by the way, something as a little revelation I'll just share with you that I'll probably share in the coming weeks. I did not know this. I just learned this and it made me mad. The Cairo Museum, which is one of the largest museums housing a multiplicity of artifacts, they will not let a certain stele, a steel, uh, sorry, a stone inscribed rock per se, they will not let the public see it. It has been hidden away in the Cairo Museum. Before it got to the Cairo Museum, it was somewhere else and they hid it. There's a reason why they're hiding it. Because interestingly enough, it is the only stone inscription anywhere and it dates back to the right time that tells you about the exodus from the words of a pharaoh, Amchos, which very much covered up, 
no one would like to talk about, but that stone inscription, very clearly, if you were looking at it on the inscription, for example, has these lines and what look like two zigzags, looks like a ZZ top thing or something. But in hieroglyphics, as you read the line going that way, this represents the waters being split open. And if you read the whole stele, which I only got to see little glimpses and pieces of it, but I saw enough to know, have enough knowledge of hieroglyphics to know what it read, and I, my jaw just went, well, how come I didn't know about this before? Well, because they won't let anybody see it, and there's a reason why. Because it is made known and can be verified and shown as something that would authenticate, not from a Hebrew perspective, but from an Egyptian perspective, telling of the massive amount of plagues and there's a whole description of what happened. They're worried that that will give the people living in Israel uh, some validation on their claim of the land. Therefore, we're going to keep it suppressed. We don't want to even acknowledge that it exists and every attempt to suppress it has been made. The other thing that's crazy is Amho's uh, mummy and his son's mummy have been hidden away there too. And up until recently, he's a kind of famous guy on TV that you've probably seen before. He was the one that went in there. He got permission to go in there. And under the auspices, by the way, that he was interested in Egyptian history, not for validating the Bible, found the Pharaoh, which correlates to the time of the Exodus, but more importantly, something that he connected the dots to that shows you guys pretty smart. Because if that Pharaoh was Pharaoh during the Exodus, and he had a son, which he did, and his son was a very young person at the time, he would have actually died with the rest of the firstborn that were killed by the death angel passing over. Now, if you want to call this fiction, but when you investigate this, sorry, the mummies don't lie, all right? Everything else can, but I said to you, what you dig out of the earth doesn't lie. Archaeology doesn't lie. You've got a study of all kinds of things. So what they, what they found is that with today's technology, they could ascertain in a 95% probability of how the sun died and there is no good reason. There is no contusions. There's no injury to the body. There's nothing. There's no sign of disease because they can tell a lot just by taking a tooth and examining it. Why don't you say, well, how would, how would that be possible? Well, for the Egyptian children, there was a sleeping structure. And that would be that, believe it or not, royalty, specifically male royalty, would sleep very close to the ground. And... Then you've got other people that would sleep elevated. I think that's the order. Anyway, they explain how this would have affected this particular person in their body. This, they can't explain. They call it a gas that passed over Egypt, whatever that means, uh, that killed everybody, whatever that gas is. I, I don't want to talk about that. <laughs> Sounds like somebody had a bad day or a bad meal. But in any event, there is really good proof to point to that and say, yep, yeah, that is indeed the Pharaoh of the Exodus, and that is his son who died in that, time, that same time period. So, you know, it's, it's wonderful. I don't need something to substantiate the Bible, but when these things come up, it's like, wow. But good luck for those people who are trying to get this released into the general public, not sure that they will have success. Anyway, back to my shtick here. So you have the thought process that based on what happens in 1 Kings 14, that Shishak or Shishank took uh, much of what was inside the temple and took it with him, all right? There's only one problem with that, and the problem is that Shishak ruled from 945 to 924 BC. Not that that's problematic, but we know that at the split of the kingdom, at the death of Solomon, when the kingdom split and divided into north and south, they had not yet been deported. The, the, the northern people had not been taken away by the Assyrians. The southern captivity had not happened. They were still practicing worship practices, including the sacrifices. So hold that thought for a minute and say that 
we're going to kick that out. I really don't think that that could be a plausible situation, although people have speculated, and hence why Steven Spielberg placed the act of where they found the Ark in Tanis. That's where he got it, if you'd like to know. Second is the hypothesis that Solomon, who we know had a son with the Queen of Sheba, whose name was Menelik, the story is that he, Menelik, snuck a replica. Gotta, gotta think about this. He snuck a replica into the temple, took the real one with him, and he would bring it to Ethiopia, and hence it would stay. There's only one problem with that. Sheba is actually the kingdom of Saba, which is located in southern Arabia. Come back to me when you figure out the geography. It doesn't line up, okay? So, ixnay that one. Well, what about the Falashas or those at the St. Mary's, or I think it's St. Mary of Zion, yeah, St. Mary's of Zion Church, that claim that they have the ark. Well, I'm going to tell you what I think they're holding and what they're guarding. I think, actually, I believe that Menelik did build a replica, and I think that's what they're holding on to, is a replica. They guard it with their life. It's some, something very sacred. Here's my problem with that, though. If people that are religious or spiritual in any way, shape, or form would even want to defend their faith, Anybody wanting to look at it should be allowed to... We're, caught, we're not talking about weirdos. We're talking about real scholars, real archaeologists, people who have knowledge. I don't care if it's a priest or a rabbi to be able to look at it. No one is allowed to see it. Now, you tell me the difference between that, which I believe is actually a real artifact, just a copy, versus the things that have been found, which we know are perpetuated idiocies, sorry to say it, of the Catholic Church, which is, for example, I've told you about the mother of Constantine claiming that she had found the nails and the titulus of Christ and she brought them back to him and they became venerated in the church. Sure, okay. And we'll also charge you for that, too. You must pay a fee to see it, right? Okay. So I have issues with this, but there's something really important that I want to point out. The people who claim that the ark is in Axiom and it was brought there Axiom came into existence, look this up, in 100 AD, and that's about the time span, that's 100 years after Christ. Not 100 years, but 100 AD. So my problem is that if people, famed people like Graham Hancock, which I mean no respect to, disrespect to, but it doesn't add up, because if it was brought there at the time they're claiming the Ethiopians claim that it was brought there. Axiom did not exist. And you say, well, what's the point? Well, they have a tradition that has been housed in this particular house of worship since a particular date. The dates don't line up, so sorry. I'm going to kick that out. It doesn't work for me either. Then there is the Nebuchadnezzar theory. Some say that when he captured or destroyed Jerusalem in 586 B.C., he took along many of the items that were in the temple. That's true. The Bible says that. But is there a mention of him taking the ark specifically? No. And this is what me thinks, okay? In this typical time frame, do you not think that it would have been perpetuated that when the people who actually took the ark, remember there's a previous story to people taking the ark that wasn't theirs to take, and they wanted to give it back as soon as they could because people were dropping dead and bad stuff was happening around the ark because they took it. I don't think that that story would not have circulated enough for even a person like Nebuchadnezzar to say, hell no, right? So I don't know. I still have an issue with that one, plus the fact I think had he captured the ark and took it with him, the big question is, what would he do with it and where would it be? Now, some people said he probably melted it down, he turned it into whatever. And just so you know, when people started actually trying to dig and explore, and there have been a lot of people since about the time of Howard Carter looking into King Tut's tomb, about the same time people are looking for the Ark, you've got a whole litany of people who claim that they've got a, they caught a glimpse of it or they've seen it. Eh, okay. What did you see? Well, I can't really tell you how I saw it, but I can describe it kind of, but not really. It's all very ambiguous. Not buying that either, but I'll come back to that one. 
there is a reference in the fourth book of Ezra, which is in the apocryphal, if you want, in the Septuagint, rather. It says there that there is a reference that it was taken, and they give a whole ex explanation there. And my only problem with that is that another biblical book will counter, it will just kind of blow that out of, out of the water. Second Maccabees 2, 4 through 6, it says Jeremiah is told to hide the ark in Mount Nebo. So how could it be there and there at the same time? It can't. According to Second Baruch 6, 5 through 9, an angel came down from heaven into the Holy of Holies, took much of the contents, it says, the veil, the ephod, the mercy seat, the two tables, the raiment of the priest, etc. I don't know, okay? But I actually have to tell you there's something in the New Testament that actually might corroborate this, as wacky as that sounds, but hold that thought. There's also the theory that Antiochus Epiphanes took the ark to Syria because of what's written in 1 Maccabees 1, 21 through 24. I don't think that's accurate either. See, everybody wants to say they have the ark, right? But nobody can produce the goods. So Josephus, who writes obviously at a time very concomitant with the young Christ, says there was no ark in the second, no ark of the covenant in the second temple. Now, this is interesting because he claims that he was in the second temple and he saw no ark. Kind of interesting, but that's at a later time, and I kind of would happen to say there's good reason for that. Then there are the rabbis who claim that they have seen the ark in a tunnel under the temple, which the Israeli government sealed the entrance with cement because the Arabs were protesting that they were so near to the Dome of the Rock that it caused a ruckus. In fact, there's a kind of interesting story about this. They bribed the, the spiritual guards of the Dome. They went away and they came back. The guards came back and they heard the sound of digging right by the wall. And they said, uh, we better put some young children down there and see what's going on. Of course, they were found out because they couldn't be quiet. So who knows? Ron Wyatt, who's made his claim to fame, began digging in 1979. And in 1982, he made the bold declaration that he had seen the ark. But then he said, well, we can't get in there. Vendel Jones claimed that he found the Ark by the caves of Qumran from his translation of the Copper Dead Sea Scrolls, but when they went to dig at the location, nothing. All right, let me leave you with the most important one. Remember I said to you, God said to Moses, see to it that you build it exactly to the pattern that I tell you. And there was a reason for it. Now, whether people believe this or not, I believe that what the New Testament says is true, that everything that happened on earth, there is an exact and true copy of in heaven. And the book of Revelation, I believe it's 1119, talks about the ark. As John is seeing in heaven, he sees the ark of the covenant. That's why I said I might give credence, as wacky as that one seems, that either that is the actual or what's in heaven is the actual and what was made on earth is the copy, if that makes any sense. But that being said, this is why I come back to something in the Old Testament. When Ezekiel is talking about the final temple to be built and he omits the ark, the ark's main function was the blood sacrifice. So let me ask you a question. The sprinkling of the blood that would take away the sins of the people. If that is not there in a built temple, what would function as taking away the people's sins? And we know that that temple will be built at a time when a lot of other things are happening on earth, pointing to the return of Christ, of course, and at that particular time, there will be no need for a blood offering because he made it already once and for all. That is why there actually are several pieces that are not in that temple to be built. And as I said, this is what, it's kind of mind-boggling. It's unfortunate to me when I hear people get very dogmatic and they refuse to even acknowledge that what is in the Old Testament spells out clearly that it will not be there, it will not happen again, there is not going to be another whole concept of offering. And although there are people preparing to offer what is called the red heifer, unfortunately, think about 
where that will be offered and it will not be offered, nor will the blood be offered, nor will the ashes be offered on the Ark of the Covenant. There's a place to offer that. It is not the Ark of the Covenant. So, again, I digress to that and I say to you, it's, it's tragic, but the thing that I want to kind of bring back here is what the book of Hebrews talks about in this once and for all sacrifice, and I'd like to read it to you. So, starting at verse 23 where I left off, and I'm going to go into the 10th chapter, it was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these, speaking of blood, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these, for Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us, nor yet that he should offer himself often, as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with the blood of others. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world, but now once, in the end of the world, hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And it was appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. For the law, having a shadow of good things to come, that's why I said shadow and substance, for the law having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered? That's what I'm asking the question, because they did cease. Because that worshippers once purged should have had no more conscience of sins. But in those sacrifices there is remembrance again made of sins every year. So you have to go with the Day of Atonement over every single year repeated, year after year after year. But in these sacrifices there is remembrance again made of the sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. And I think even the priests that were commissioned in the tabernacle knew that. I'm pretty clear when you read and study about the priesthood, they were following God's orders, but I don't think they themselves even could, I think they could see the imperfection of the provisions made. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, thou hast had no pleasure, then said I, Lo, I come, in the volume of the book it is written of me, to do thy will, O God. Above, when he said, Sacrifice and offering, and burnt offerings, and offering for sin thou wouldest not, neither hadst pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God, to take away the first, that he may establish the second, by the which will we are sanctified, sorry, by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God and from henceforth expecting till his enemies may bait a footstool by, for by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. The important thing is what is in verse 16. This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws. This is a quote out of Jeremiah 31, 33. And if you would look to Jeremiah, don't do it now, but write it down. It's even in the Old Testament saying, I will give you a New Testament. I will give you something new and different that you have not seen before. And he's, the writer of Hebrews is quoting Jeremiah right here. He says, I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds will I write them, and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now, where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. So you've got to kind of put all this in proper perspective. And if you're looking at the shadows and types, hopefully next week I will actually attempt to make some drawings for you. Drawings. <laughs> uh, very interesting drawings, too, at that. But it, I hope to be able to show you that even in every way possible, not just by the words of the writer of Hebrews, not by the words of Jeremiah, Ezekiel, by Zechariah. The list goes on of Old Testament writers that all pointed to something in the future not yet come. So my question is, 
how can we ignore that? How could anybody ignore that? That's really a mind-boggling question. Greater than that is to understand something. The whole book, put together old and new, there's a concept that runs straight through it. It is the unfolding drama of the redemption of humankind after the fall. That, if you want to go from cover to cover, is, from cover to cover, God's way of saying, creation gone a little bit off the rails, and without my help, initially, instructions that could guide, but God even calls the children of Israel rebellious and stiff-necked because they would not listen and they would not learn, and that's why he sent the prophets to tell them to repent, and it took, by the way, if you think about it, the message keeps being proclaimed until John the Baptist comes and he says, he says, repent. He doesn't say repent of your sins or repent. He says, repent, the kingdom of heaven's at hand, pointing to Christ, then says, behold, the Lamb of God who taketh away the sins of the world. It's mind-boggling that if you really do investigate what's written in the old, you cannot read these one without the other. You cannot look at the New Testament and just take it and say, I only want to deal with this or the old, and I only want to deal with this. But when you put them together, you see actually God had a plan. He had provision. His desire to be amongst the people. This is why I said, build me a tabernacle, a place that I might come and dwell among the people. God's desire to be with his creation has not ceased. The thing is, in the New Testament, he decided he'd pour out his spirit and God's people would receive what the Apostle Paul calls the earnest the Greek word is erebon, the part deposit, if you will, of the spirit that puts, places God in you, the presence of God in you and around you, no longer needing a special dwelling place, but in these pots of whatever you want to call them, earth or whatever they are, that's where he says, now I will take up my abode. And in part, a part deposit until this old body is put down, and the new body is received, which means the completion of that deposit is made where you're in his presence forever, never being separated. Now, I don't know about you, but when I look at these passages, I can't help but think God not only had a great plan. You know, imagine if the children of Israel had been as obedient as they could be. Imagine that. And they had not complained and they had not made God so angry repeatedly over and over again. Imagine what God might have, might have had to do to reveal Christ, because that was an inevitability. That was prophesied in Genesis 3.15, which we call the Proto-Evangelion, the before the gospel gospel. So imagine God still had to make this come to pass. But if you think about it, it's no accident. Why would people who were delivered out of Egypt's bondage not and seeing the miracles and seeing the plagues and everything else, why would they not be persuaded? Uh, I think I better follow in obedience and comply with whatever the big boss is saying, but instead repeatedly chose disobedience. And it just, it is the real reason why we spent all this time talking about the lost tribes. It's the reason why the people were deported. God said, I will scatter the north to the wind, never to return until the ultimate day where in Ezekiel the two sticks of the two houses are joined back together. And to the house of Judah, a whole band carried away and less than 50,000 people return. They could have all come back. Think about that. The southern kingdom was really where we begin to see a lot of the customs that become Judaism. But the southern kingdom, only a small percentage of people come back. That ought to tell you that they weren't so enthused with God's ways because they could have all come back. So it's almost as though God said, this is the way it's going to happen. And it only took the willingness of these vessels to make it come to pass. Just as he used the Chaldeans or the Babylonians or the Assyrians to accomplish his bidding, he did the same thing with the children of Israel. And that kind of is a sad statement on the one side, but on the other side it tells me God had a plan all along and the greatest thing on earth for those people who will look and study and read, you can say fantasy, fiction, fabrication until you turn blue in the face. But when you start to see what I call the greater evidences, which I don't need for faith, but when you start to see the greater influences and evidences that do exist, that have been unearthed, all of the different things that still tell you the validation 
of what happened in the old, including what they're now, they've just recently, I think, shared with you. They uncovered that pool where Jesus was standing with the man, which we know is the place. You know, somebody says, oh, that's just a made-up place. No, it's there. And plenty of other things that are definitely real and tangible that have been unearthed tell me that anyone who really wants to learn not just about God and spirituality, but lessons that teach us of how really messed up we are. All of us, I don't care where you come from, need help, need guidance, need God's provision. By the way, the tabernacle provided all that. It provided guidance, instruction. It provided a way of worship. It provided everything that somebody could need if they would look there. Now we look to Christ. Christ, in his own words, says, I am the light, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the bread of life. Anyone who comes to me, and I could keep going, saying presence, provision, the ability, by the way, the Bible says all the promises in this book are in him now. That means that we can claim them for ourselves. So all I'd say to you is for somebody who's really searching or looking, this is a wonderful study as an introduction. It's reinforcement for those people who already know the scriptures. And for those of you who are interested, tune in next week because I'm going to give you a lot of numbers. You're going to go, oh, God, I hate that. I'm going to give you a lot of numbers and, as I said, drawings most likely, uh, which you'll go, wow, what was that? But I will try, okay? But the idea here is to show you the splendor of what God laid out was not a one-hit wonder, but essentially the shadow of the substance we find in Christ. I hope you'll be here next week when I pick up the subject and hopefully elaborate on the things without too much review. But that's my message. I'm Pastor Melissa Scott, pastor of Faith Center, Glendale, California. I teach every Sunday morning at 11 a.m., if you'd like to attend services with us, simply call the 800 number, that is 800-338-3030, to join us. If you'd like to watch, listen, and learn 24 hours a day, simply log on to our website at www.pastormelissascott.com.